Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for uh, attending our final session of the Student Financial Wellness Workshops. Today's topics, uh, topic is alternative financial services cost. Um, really useful information, especially for students that aren't able to uh, open a bank account for whatever reasons. Um, so I will go ahead and give the floor to CJ and take it away, CJ. Great. Thanks so much. So in the interest of time, I'm sorry to say we're going to skip our trivia, but I just want to remind you that this is has a two-pronged approach when we do our workshops. The first is to provide you with tools and tips and tricks to be more financially savvy, more comfortable in your personal financial wellness skin. And the second is to provide you with information and resources that you can use to start a conversation with your peers, your family and friends and so forth. So we are really put in two different topics that we're going to wildly um, pursue. And that is our alternative financial products as well as identity theft. So let's get started. We have a lot to cover in a short period of time. So when we think about um, banking, it's important for us to understand that some people don't bank. So our objectives today are to classify financial service providers by type of organization, summarize services offered by financial institutions, really focus on the alternative financial services, and look at the costs and fees that are related to financial services. And look at, again, sort of a discussion around how current and predicted bank trends will impact individuals. So our overview is to talk about banked, unbanked, and underbanked, look at banks versus credit unions, look at financial services options, alternative financial services, and then how do we shop online if we don't have a credit or debt? So what I'd like you to think about, and I'm gonna save you from going ahead and using the menti.com, but I'd just like you to think about um, what kind of services do you use? at your particular credit union or at your um, bank. So you might use a checking account, you might have a debit card, you might have a credit card, you could possibly have a loan. So take a moment and just internally think about what is it that you use at your bank? Um, now I'm gonna make an assumption that you have a bank account, but maybe you don't. So that's another piece of the puzzle about why don't people have a bank account? Well, let's talk about that because we may have many people that we have on campus or family and friends who indeed do not have any kind of an account with a commercial financial institution. And let me share with you that when I use the word bank, really think of it as a verb because banks and credit unions are both financial services institutions. And it gets hard to go back and forth and keep saying banks and credit unions. So I'm just using it as, um, do you bank? So interestingly enough, here are the reasons that people do not have a bank account. First of all, they don't think they have enough money to actually open an account. Um, this particular uh, issue is cited by about 29% of those households that are unbanked, which means that no one in the household has a relationship with a financial services institution. It could be the lack of understanding about the US banking system and expectations for having a bank account. So many of our new Americans um, have not had the opportunity to be involved in a centralized banking system that exists in our country. Could be that someone had a past negative banking experience in the United States. Maybe they had a lot of overdrafts. Maybe they felt that the bank was really out to get them. They might have had negative banking experiences in their homeland. So again, anyone coming from another country, um, banks are not insured in um, most other countries outside of the United States. And they may lock lack appropriate documentation needed to open a bank account. And we'll talk about that in just a moment. There is also a fear of being reported to authorities, meaning that individuals who do not have, are not here legally in the United States are concerned about being deported. So they're in hiding. Could be that they have an unstable living situation. 
meaning that maybe they're couch surfing. Maybe they are living in their car. They don't really have an address that would work for that documentation. So some of those really fall into a bigger category, which is simply that they don't trust banks. And that was cited by 16.1%. That was the second most cited reason for not having a bank account. Now, the last piece is something that we should all be very sensitive to, which is that there could be cultural conflicts, um, including bank practices that vary with personal beliefs. So there are many cultures who bank among themselves. So in Denver, Colorado, the Hmong, H-M-O-N-G, the Hmong population does not bank with any of the banks in the community. They have their own and I'm gonna use the word underground just to give you more of a detail, but it really is an underground banking system, very sophisticated, but they do not have any trust in the United States banking system. And that's certainly their culture and their right. So again, we wanna approach this topic with our family, friends, and students as just out of curiosity. I'm curious, um, have you thought about a bank account? Because we'll talk about why that might be important. But back to the piece about, well, I don't have the documentation. I'm happy to say that, especially in California, um, your own Paulina Gonzalez, executive director of the California Reinvestment Coalition said, anyone is a, anybody who is able to establish their identity is able to open an account. So banks are required by law at a minimum to confirm a person's name, date of birth and address and to obtain account, an identification number. So that could be a social security number, or it could be the um, individual, um, the ITIN, ITIN, right. So your individual um, identification number, it could actually um, be a foreign passport or a foreign driver's license. Um, and immigration status is not among the required information. But despite that, we know that a number of new Americans still hesitate to open bank accounts. Um, they prefer cash if they come from countries where financial institutions are distrusted or currency fluctuates quickly. It echoes the unease prevalent in communities already living with uncertainty. So according to a recent study um, actually done in, in 2017 by the Pew Research Center, about two thirds of Latino immigrants, both lawful and um, permanent residents and those without American citizenship or green cards said they worried about themselves or someone close to them being deported. So we want to be sensitive to the variety of reasons why people might not have a bank account. But it is important to know that, um, again, as Paulina says, anybody who is able to establish an identity is able to open up an account. Now, in addition to some of the things that I've mentioned that banks require, it's possible that there are additional requirements by a bank or credit union, but again, none of them are have anything to do with immigration status. Well, let's look at what we're talking about when we talk about unbanked, banked, and underbanked. So this comes from a report on the economic well-being of U.S. households in 2019 and May 2020 from the Federal Reserve. So this particular report is um, to assess the inclusivity of the banking system, and it's also in partial fulfillment of a statutory responsibility. But this report is, con is conducted every two years to estimate the proportion of households that do not fully participate in the banking system. And again, that includes banks and credit unions. So the latest survey identified the following. 6% of US households, and what that means is approximately 7.5 million were unbanked in 2019. And again, that means that no one in the household had a checking or savings account at any financial services institution. 96% of households and approximately 124.3 million were banked. However, of those households that were banked, 16% were underbanked. And that means that while the household had an account at an insured institution, that particular household also obtained financial services and products outside of the banking system. 
So let's do a quick comparison of what banks and credit unions have, how they operate. So a bank has deposits insured up to 25, 250,000 by the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation and credit unions have that similar uh, insurance, but it's provided by the National Association of um, Credit Unions. Another difference is that banks have certainly are their for-profit. And that's why people start banks is that they're interested in either A, selling the bank for five times book and getting their money back that way, or they might be interested in um, getting um, a dividend. Not-for-profit is what credit unions are all about. They were started as financial cooperatives owned by their members and banks are private investors, business corporations owned by private investors. So truly back in the day, um, it might be a group of firefighters who decided they wanted to um, lend among themselves. And so they created a credit union. It might've been uh, grocery store workers. It could have been quilters. Um, a number of entities got their start with people who were like-minded or who worked in the same industry. Today, that particular requirement is no longer true. You could join the firefighters credit union if there was such a thing in your, in your town by pi probably paying a $5 membership fee. So that's a little bit of a change in history. Banks are governed by a board of directors chosen, chosen by the stockholders. Whereas a credit union is governed by a board of directors elected by and from among those members. So I've been a member of Wells Fargo for more years than I like to remember, and I'll never be on their board of directors. But if I happen to be part of a credit union, the chances are reasonably safe that I might have that opportunity. So I'm gonna go ahead and we'll do this together, but I'm gonna have Maria put in the banking services IQ into the chat box. I'm gonna pull this up for us to look at together. So let's go ahead in the interest of time and just look at the first question. A remittance is a, could be a card under which you load money to be used for future purchases, money transfer that goes to a bank or person in another country, document that is used like a check to pay a bill, or a method of electronically transferring money from one bank to another. Who wants to um, take a guess at that multiple guess question? You can pop that in the chat box if you want or just shout it out. So we've got one guess is D, it's actually B as in boy. It is a money transfer that goes to a bank or a person in another country. Now the debit card shouldn't be too hard to figure out what it is. So is it A, used to make purchases at retail locations and for ATM cash withdrawals? Or is it B, as a buy now pay later feature like credit cards? C is similar to a gift card from a retail store. Absolutely A, yes. However, while you may think, well, that was easy, CJ, remember that we talked last week about the fact that because your debit card has a MasterCard or Visa logo on it, many of our students are confused and think that the debit card is like a credit card. So just a good reminder that that is not true. So this is sort of a difficult one. What type of account is typically insured by the FDIC? Is it a deposit account or a non-deposit account? It is indeed A. 
So let me go back to the comment about you can use it as credit. Um, again, that is not exactly correct because it still comes out of your checking account. So when you use your debit card and you are at a point of sale and they ask you if you want it to be credit or debit, all that that's allowing you to do is skip using your actual PIN number in case someone is watching you do that. Um, it still comes directly from your checking account. So it's a little bit of a um, misnomer on that one. Number four, with online banking, you can access your accounts at any time to A, view your account balances, B, conduct transactions such as transferring money between accounts, paying bills, ordering checks, C, download information such as your monthly statement, D, change account number information like your address and phone number or E, all of the above. It is indeed all of the above. So the reason that we point that out is because if you're looking for opportunities to share with individuals who are unbanked, these four items are some good things to know about what it is that someone could do with their bank account. Number five, what banking services may be offered with some deposit accounts? Select all that apply. Money orders, free telephone and online banking, discount on loans, free checking. And I'm sure that you answered A, B, C, D, because that is another reason to share with people what it is that is possible with a, an account. And six is also a trick question. Which of the following is a good reason to use a bank? Your money is insured. Your money is safe from theft, loss, and fire. You can access your money quickly and easily. And yes, indeed, it is D. Um, so we provide this, again, as an opportunity for you to work with students, family, and friends to understand that there could be some reasons that make sense to have an account. But let me step back and just be sure that you understand that this is not about a hard sell. We're not suggesting that everybody gets a bank account or a credit union account. We're simply wanting to set the stage for understanding that there are some hidden costs and some obvious costs for using products that are outside of the mainstream of a bank. So let's continue as we look at not only what's the difference, but look at the things that um, are common. So these are the common services. We've just talked about many of them. And within a credit union and a bank, there could be a differential about possibly a fee for some of these. It's possible that some of the money orders might cost, but will cost less than getting a money order outside of the bank. Um, same with the remittance. So good to know that all of those things are available. So let me ask you this. When you hear the word alternative bank products, alternative financial services products, um, what, what comes to mind? Can you think of one that might fit into that? Maybe you yourself as you have used it or maybe family and friends have. There's um, the online banking, um, like a, it's not like a secure uh, account, it's more like an online uh, app, banking slash extra, but you could use it as a bank and or uh, a debit card that's prepaid, there you go, a prepaid account. Okay. Yeah, so that's actually what we would still call not necessarily an alternative financial product, but that's a good thing um, because you can get that from a bank as well as um, usually it's from a financial institution. So here's the interesting thing. If you're not using these, you won't be necessarily familiar with them. And again, I'm gonna start by saying that this is a sensitive topic. And let me share with you why it's sensitive. If I don't actually have a bank account, I need to navigate the world in a different fashion. So I'm gonna tell you that all of these alternative financial services are viable, they're valuable, but what we wanna be able to do is share with our circle of influence 
that they're costly. So the curiosity piece is I'm interested, you're paying X amount for a money order from Kroger, when if you had a bank account, you might pay less. Because what we're here about today is smart money management, is being able to educate individuals and inform them that there might be a different way to go about navigating their world. So money orders are certainly, um, money's guaranteed by a third party, such as a post office and a grocery store or Walmart. So there's a fee included in that issuance. That fee is less than the bank fee because they already know you have the money in the account. Now we talked about international remittances. It's a transfer of money by a foreign worker to an individual in his or her home country. Interestingly enough, the latest statistics show that money sent home by new Americans competes with international aid as one of the largest flows of money to developing countries. But here's an interesting fact. I have a colleague up in North Dakota, running, used to run a construction company, hired a lot of um, new, new Americans, some of them legal, some of them not. And because he was actually a former bank auditor, he wanted these individuals to enjoy the benefit of having their money insured and safe. So he met with a community banker, met with the bank president, sort of acted as a guarantor for these accounts, got his crew signed up for accounts, everything, was excited about giving them a check and then having them put it into the bank. And the first pay period came and went and he just happened to be on his way home, stopped off at the local Walmart. And where was his crew? They were all at that Walmart sending money home. What he hadn't factored in is the fact that in Mexico, there is no central banking system. So having a small bank in North Dakota try to send money to Mexico was beyond impossible. But Walmart to Walmart, not a problem. So good intentions, not enough information. So remembering though that Walmart Sending money from Walmart to Walmart takes a pretty large chunk out of that paycheck. So again, is there something else that we could be thinking about? The check cashing outlets. So checking cashing outlets obviously are in it to make, a business, to make money. And they do that by taking part of your check in response to giving cashing your, your check for you. So I wanna share a story, it happened to me a number of years ago. I was working in Denver, Colorado as a banker for the only bank in the world for youth 21 and under. So I was called into what was called the bridge project, happened to be in the project, so to speak. And a group of young men had been trained to um, work on computers, primarily of being able to take apart a computer, check out the motherboard, put it all back together again. and for that training, they were also then getting paid to teach middle school students how to do that very same thing. I'd been called in as a financial advisor because what they had noticed, the program director had noticed that these, there were five young men, were um, taking their paychecks and cashing them to uh, at a check cashing outlet just two blocks away from the projects. And what they wanted me to do was come in and talk about possible bank accounts. So I walked in and I had five young men who had their arms crossed in front of their chests and looked less than engaged. And I started a little bit of a spiel. And then finally I said, hey, let's stop all of this. I said, um, you know, I need someone to, to talk to me. What's going on here? And let's, let's just have a conversation. So, finally one of the young men said all right so I'll tell you he said I use the check cashing outlet because when I get home I give most of the money to my parents to help them out but I want to keep a little bit for myself if I take the check home then they know how much I actually make I said I commend you and I appreciate your willingness to support your family 
I said, what if I shared with you an idea that would put more money in your pocket, but the same amount of money in your parents' pockets? There was a little bit of conversation and they, they finally said, yeah, go ahead. So I explained to them that if they were to open up a savings account at a local bank, credit union, that then they could take their check every payday and cash it for no fee, put a little bit more in their pocket, take the same home to mom and dad, instead of leaving on the money on the table for the man, as it were. They looked less than enthused and said, yeah, maybe. And I said, hey, you know, I wish you the best. Two days later, I was at the bank and I had the bank's uh, CEO call me and say, hey, there are two guys here wanting to see you. Well, one of them is what I would call the leader and possibly his lieutenant. And he showed up and he said, I heard what you said. I'm going to do it. I said, okay. So I'm happy to tell you that he was probably 16 at the time and stayed with the bank until he turned 21, which is the moment that we said he was a senior citizen and he had to leave the bank. His lieutenant came along a little bit later and also opened up a savings account. But the point here is, is that there's nothing wrong with going to a check cashing outlet, except that you're paying a fee and you're not getting that in your pocket, somebody else's. Because again, I'm not gonna open a check cashing outlet unless I'm gonna make some money. So I'm making money and I'm taking it from you. Then we've got the payday loans. Payday is too far away. So I'm gonna get a payday loan, which sounds great at the moment, but this is a dangerous slippery slope because the actual annual interest rate is unbelievable. And what happens to you is, is that it just doesn't ever seem to go away. So whether you call it a payday loan or Wells Fargo likes to call it a, di a direct deposit advance, it's still costly. So we want to make certain, again, not because we're judging, but we're simply saying, read the fine print. I mentioned to a group yesterday that I fell into the direct deposit advance. It sounded so sexy and so not so payday loany that um, about 10 years ago, I clicked submit and it took me six months to get back out of that dismal space. So been there, done that. Oops. Let me go back. So then there's the Uncle Sam is here to help. So this year we got a break. Our taxes weren't due until May 15th, but there is such a thing as the RAL, the Tax Refund Anticipation Loan. Please don't misunderstand. I'm not dissing H&R Block, but this is what happens. You go to H&R Block or some other um, tax preparing entity and they prepare your taxes and they go, oh, look, CJ, looks like you're gonna get a $1,200 refund. But boy, do you really wanna wait until that check comes? Because if you want, we're happy to make you a loan for $1,200. And then when it comes in, you can pay us back. Well, that sounds like a great idea. And probably eight out of 10 times it is okay, but, the IRS and the H&R Block or whatever tax preparation entity don't always see eye to eye. So there you are waiting for your $1,200 check that H&R Block said was coming. And the IRS says, yeah, not so fast. We found a little bit of an error. So we're going to send you back $800. Well, now you're 400 bucks in the hole. And what are you going to do about that? We also know that we have people who go, oh gosh, I'm going to have them um, withhold as much as they can, and I'm going to get that big refund at the end of the year because that's the only way I know how to save. Nothing wrong with that. There are other people who go, uh-uh-uh, I'm not letting the government have one more penny than they deserve, so I'm not going to do that. I'm going to make sure that they're taking out what they should and I, don't, I hope I don't have to pay, but I'm sure not gonna get a big refund. It doesn't matter which way you go, it's just knowing what you're doing. Because if you really are able to make that a savings piece, you get a tax refund, it goes directly to your emergency fund. Hey, 
It sounds like a deal to me. Then we've got porn pawn shops. Um, obviously they're in it for the money. Um, they're not doing you any charity. They're not designed to um, be able to make that happen for you. They're looking for cash. So there is no shame in going to a pawn shop because again, all of these financial services are alternatives to a bank and they serve a purpose. They provide people who don't want a bank with access to cash. It's just, again, is it worth the price? So pawn shops are in it for the money and they charge a fee. And sometimes you get rid of something because it, you don't want to, but it has, and it has sentimental value. They don't offer you ever what it's ever actually worth because why would they? And then you don't actually get back to get it. So grandmother's ring, maybe it didn't have a lot of value, but a lot of sentimental value, it's not available anymore. Or you were looking to make a much better deal on something and it didn't happen because the cash just wasn't there. Then we've got the rent to own. This in particular, um, for individuals who might just be starting out and they're getting an apartment with three or four friends because they're going to college, this is a huge, um, it's, it sounds like such a great deal. We need a TV, so let's get a TV from rent to own. And then if you do the math, it turns out that you could have bought a really big TV by the end of the time. Or my favorite is when somebody buys a couch rent to own. And by the time that couch is paid off, ugh, it's got some scary stuff hanging out in that couch. Vehicle title loans. Your car is worth $5,000. You get a loan amount. And then you get the interest charged, all of that good stuff. And then, oh my gosh, you can't actually get the car back. And so now it's been repossessed. So that's a difficulty. Let's see what else we've got here. Oh, loan sharks mean business. Yes. So we sort of make jokes sometimes about, you know, various um, individuals who might lend you some money or come and, and hurt you if you don't pay back. But we know this is still a live market. Um, so you're using somebody who knows somebody who knows somebody, gives you some money. It's all going to work out. Probably not. Um, and this can be a fairly scary situation. Happy holidays. Woohoo! Free checks. Oh my gosh, I can't believe my credit card company realized how much I really wanted some free checks. Well, no, they aren't free checks. Maybe the paper is, but it's actually a cash advance. So you're paying the cash advance fee for the free checks that you just got in the mail. Well, again, what I want you to think about is that no judgment on any of these. These are viable and valuable alternative services, but each one comes with a cost. And the question is, and the opportunity for the conversation is, I'm curious, have you thought about having a bank account? Because the fees are much less. <coughs> So I want you to be thinking about how you might have a conversation with family and friends who might be using any of these. And again, it's a viable source. <coughs> Pardon me. <coughs> because here's what we know. There are a few ways to shop online <coughs> without a bank account. America, Amazon Cash doesn't charge you any fees. PayPal, my cash card does have a fee. Pay near me encourages merchants to absorb the fees, but the transactions, um, but the transactions with some merchants incur a fee. So I wanted to take the time to talk about those particular alternative financial services. I also wanted to make sure if you had any questions about those, because we're going to turn our, our um, attention to identity theft. 
for the last few moments that we have together. <clears throat> okay, so again, just want to reemphasize, there are reasons that people use those alternative financial services. Um, and we talked about why people aren't banking. And so I do want you to think about the fact that um, everyone has their own reasons for having an account or not having an account. We just want to approach people with curiosity and we want to give them information. They'll still make their own choice, but I would feel better as I did with those young men that I shared with them that they were losing money actually by paying the man a fee for check, cashing a check. Um, and I didn't know what they'd do with it, but I felt good about giving them information that they didn't have access to before. And two out of the five decided to make a change and they were the richer for it, but you can't change everybody. Well, let's talk about a scary topic because it is a scary topic. Identity theft and fraud. We want to talk about the current identity theft and fraud statistics, recognize the financial impact of identity theft, discover how information is stolen and deceptively used, and find out ways to protect against identity theft. So we're going to talk about what's in your wallet. We're going to identify, uh, we're going to define identity theft. We're going to look at the consequences of identity theft, the consequences to you, quite frankly. What are the stats? What are the top 10 scams? And then how do we deter, detect, and defend? So right now, if Maria would pop this into the chat box, I'm gonna ask you to just take the next two minutes and you probably don't have um, access to your backpack or anything like that, but this is asking you what's in your wallet. So what we're looking for, let me pull this up, is giving yourself points if you have any of these things in your wallet or your backpack or your purse. So just take a cursory glance, sort of think about what your score might be. Maybe you've got a credit card. Maybe you've got several in your, in your pocket. Maybe you've got your ID photo. Maybe you got some, a $5 bill, maybe some change. Maybe you're carrying around your original social security card. Maybe you've got some pictures. Maybe it's where you keep your secret decoder ring for your computer passwords. Maybe you've had to write down your PIN numbers. Maybe you got a library card, paycheck stub, maybe some deposit slips. Maybe you've got a coupon. Maybe that's where you stash your car keys. Maybe you're carrying around a flash drive. Got your cell phone. Maybe it fits in your purse or your backpack. Got your driver's license, some Kleenex, a membership card. Maybe you got a snack or two. Maybe a store receipt. So think for a moment, even if you're just thinking in your head, what's in my wallet? Huh? What's in my purse? What's in my backpack? So if you've got that sort of thinking about what is in those particular packages, your wallet, your purse, your backpack. Here's the reality, the reason that we care. And my hope is that you have a very low score and you don't have a very high score because quite frankly, what your identity theft uh, experts will tell you is that there are very few things that you should carry at all in your wallet. And they even go so far as to say just figure out day to day what you need to take and don't take more than you need. So your driver's license or a state form of, of ID, maybe one or two credit cards that you need for that day with no pin numbers on them and possibly any other personal documentation that you need to show who you are. But many of us have a whole lot of stuff in our purse. So if you've got some deposit slips or you've got some checks, that's information that an identity theft would, thief would love to have. Um, so think about the fact that we carry around a lot of things that really are just ripe for the picking. 
So this again is a great opportunity for you to work with students, family and friends, because here's what we know about identity thieves. Listen carefully. It's not about the money. Matter of fact, they hope you don't have any money. They hope you have no credit history. They want your ID for a lot of different reasons. The other piece of the puzzle is, is that there are two very, very vulnerable populations. Those populations happen, happen to be 18 to 24 because they are the major users of social media who put it all out there for identity thieves to pick up on. And then individuals who are probably 70 and above. So even if you're in, not in that group, you are a target. So let's talk about why that is. Because when we talk about identity theft, some people are confused and think, again, it has something to do with money. Well, what is identity theft? First of all, it's a federal crime. And secondly, it occurs when someone uses your personally identifying information like your name, social security number, or credit card number without your permission for unlawful activities. So again, we're not talking about hacking into your bank accounts yet. Well, what are the consequences? First of all, identity thieves can ruin your credit because they are creating a whole new person and they are using your identification to make that happen. Here's another very sensitive situation. What identity theft experts will tell you is that most victims knew the perpetrator, family or friends. We see a huge amount of parents using their children's social security numbers to set up completely different people. Sometimes you might run into a student who has just turned 18 or 19, checks their credit and discovers it is a mess. Nothing they ever did with it, but a family member did. So be sensitive to that. You can get in trouble with the IRS because all of a sudden a new you has a whole big salary coming in and they're not paying taxes. What they say is that it can take up to 5,840 hours, which is the equivalent of working a full-time job for two years to correct the damage from identity theft, depending on the severity of the um, case. This is about creating a whole separate you. So again, it's not the money in your account. And so people say, oh, I don't have any money. Nobody would steal from me. That's not what they're stealing they're stealing you. Here is the thing that is the most terrifying because it could cost you your life. One of the biggest concerns in, is the medical fraud that is happening. So let's say somebody uses your identity to get medical care and they change your medical records because when the doctor says, I see that you're allergic to penicillin and you go, oh no, I don't know how that got, that's a mistake, I'm not allergic. Because it's not you saying that, it's the new you saying you're not allergic to penicillin. So the records get changed for the new you. A couple of years later, you're in a situation, you walk into a hospital and the records don't say anything about your allergy to penicillin. And they give you penicillin. That could be the end of you. So what we... Oftentimes here is, oh, this will never happen to me. Well, I have a good friend at the Colorado Bureau of Investigation, and she constantly reminds me that it's not if, it's when. So the FTC estimates that as many as 9 million Americans have their identity stolen each year. Every three seconds, another identity is stolen in the U.S. How is it done? And if you'll bear with me for about five more minutes, we'll whip through this. They still use mail, which means they change your um, mailing address. You know that you can walk into any post office, ask for one of those pink mail changes, mail address changes, and nobody asks for your ID. That's how they do it. They also steal your mail. They're still doing it the old way, stealing a wallet. Dumpster diving, they have no issue about dumping, uh, diving into that dumpster to get your 
information that you chose not to shred. They do like to pretext. So that means that they're contacting you through mail, phone, or text, attempting to ask, reveal your information because they ask you to verify something. No bank will ever ask you to verify your account. Social Security will never ask you to verify your account. They might skim. That's where they put, thieves put skimmers in gas station pumps. That's why there's that red tape at your gas pump. And the skimmer sits behind the real card reader and skims off the information. So identity theft experts will tell you always use the pump closest to the building so that thieves rarely go there. They go to the pump farthest away so that they can put in the skimmer. So that's a little bit of a trick. They might be shoulder surfing. So those people that don't recognize personal space, even in this COVID time, well, they could be innocent looking shoppers at the grocery store, but they are practice thieves who are reading your credit and debit information over your shoulder. Seriously, that's how it's done. We know about phishing with a PH. That's sending an email asking you to respond and they've embedded a link that immediately takes over all of your information. Or they send you a letter that looks so much like the Wells Fargo letter that you go, oh, well, this must be them. Again, they don't ever send you a letter asking for information. No bank does. Then there's the group identity theft. You're just an innocent bystander. You went to Home Depot, got your uh, DIY product, uh, all of your stuff to do your project. And two days later, Home Depot lets you know that they were hacked. And then there's the imposter. Individuals who claim that they are in love with you and they wanna come visit you, but it'll be a little while and oh gosh, their carburetor goes out. If you could just lend them a little bit of money and then, oh my gosh, they got that fixed, but then they got a flat tire. It's never big amounts, it just adds up. It's 200 here, 300 there. Um, nearly one in five people who reported an imposter scam lost money, a whopping $328 million was um, two years ago. The last one is social networking. So we tell everything on Facebook and that's exactly where identify, identity thieves are going. They're looking to find out that you're not going to be home or they're looking to find out what your pet's name is because that's usually your password and away we go. So here's California and where you see the top 10 report categories, identity theft. Imposter scams comes right after that. So important to remember that that could be you. Well, how do you know if you've been a victim? Information regarding credit you never applied for. Maybe it's statements from lenders or businesses you never contacted. All of a sudden you don't get bills from, statements from bills you should pay and you think, wow, I won the lottery. No, you didn't. Your mailing address has been changed. That means missing mail in general. Maybe you're looking around in their credit card purchases you don't recognize or somebody's asking you to pay for an account you never opened. Well, what can you do? You can absolutely deter this by shredding everything you've got. Protect your social security number, should be in your head, no place else. Don't give out any kind of information unless you initiated the call. Never click links in emails that aren't from people that you absolutely know. You know, you just have to Put your um, mouse over the email address and oftentimes that's enough for you to know that this is bogus. Avoid the obvious, which means don't use your pet's name or your password or any information that people could obviously get to. And keep your information safe, especially if you have roommates or you're um, you know, living in um, space where a lot of people come in and out. You could detect be alert for the fact that no mail's coming or that they're unexpected bills. You suddenly got denied credit when you've got an absolutely perfect credit score in your book. Well, the new you has done something or maybe you get calls about purchases you didn't make. So look at that credit report, check your financial statements, defend against it, 
If you think you've been um, hacked into, place a fraud alert. Close accounts that you think have been temper tampered with. File a police report and report your complaints to the Federal Trade Commission. So hopefully you'll all take this down, ftc.gov forward slash ID theft. Great information about how to keep you safe. So a recap, unbanked and underbanked may be using costly alternative services. Current banking products may not meet everyone's needs. There could be some future options that would benefit those who are unbanked as far as being able to use um, different technology, but oftentimes people who are unbanked also don't have access to that technology. Identity theft occurs in a variety of ways. Clearly, it's the old fashioned way. It's most common is by stealing. And it's not about if, it's about when. So protect yourself. So the personal financial wellness challenge is to review your use of your banking relationship. Familiarize yourself with the alternative financial services in your neighborhood so you have a better opportunity to discuss costs with students. Please purchase a diamond cut shredder. You use the old shredder that just goes down like that. That won't do it, you can piece it together. And as we've talked before, get your credit report. So what's next? What's next is we hope you will start a conversation with people in your world, family, friends, and students, and give them as much opportunity to hear from you and share what we've all talked about. And I can't thank you enough for spending time with me. It's been six opportunities for us to get together and I appreciate the participation and hope that this has proven to be of value to you. I know that Maria will be sending out a evaluation and we'd love to hear about what we did right, what we could do better. And most of all, we'd love to hear how can we get more people to hear us and be part of this initiative to really become personally financially well. It's a wrap for me. Thank you so much, CJ. I uh, really appreciate your time and your insight and invaluable um, education. Um, and yeah, once again, I just want to remind you all to uh, please pass on the knowledge. Um, these sessions are recorded and I'll provide those. I did provide a resource list for local Santa Maria check cashing places that are legitimate and the fees are listed. We created that together um, on campus. And uh, yeah, and you know, I love to hear your feedback, any ways to make these more um, accessible, more relevant, um, anything at all. Um, these are for the students. And um, we do have a second round coming in October. Um, so uh, please, please uh, let us know any way that we can incentivize this, um, any way at all that we can make this better for you all. And thank you again so much, CJ. Thank you, attendees. And with that, we're done. We did it. Good job, everyone. We, we did it. So oh, we'll see you and all. Certificates will be coming, correct, Maria? Yes. Um, so I, yeah, yeah. For the students, I, I'm not sure if we were, do, were we doing those for the students as well? Yes. Okay. Excellent. Even I'll better. You, I'll send you the, um, the master. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. So you I'll bet. get those out for the students that attended all of these. And uh, for those that are asynchronous, contact me if you have any questions, if you'd like a certificate as well. And yeah. Have a good weekend, everyone, and good luck with the rest of the semester. Thank you. Hey, Maria, before you go, um, how about if I didn't attend all the, uh, all the classes? Uh, I mean, uh, will you be doing one pretty soon or again? Oh, sorry, you kind of broke up. Sorry, what was that? No, I'm not sure if it's going to be the same thing. Oh, you know, you know how I only attend like two or three classes. Can you hear me now? Yeah, I haven't sent out all the links yet. We're getting those uploaded to the Alan Hancock YouTube. So I, um, I'm waiting for those to get uploaded by public affairs. And then I think I'll just send it out in a one big email. I'll send out all six recordings with the handouts. So it can be all there and easily accessible and via YouTube. So you don't have to log in or anything to view them. So yeah, um, I'm sorry if I haven't I haven't gotten those out yet, but I will get those out as soon as possible. And yeah, thanks again for attending these. And, and uh, if you feel like joining the live sessions next round as well for the ones you missed, I'm more than happy to have you there. Uh, but yeah, I'll get you those recordings and the handouts for sure. All right, thank you, Maria.
Yeah. Yeah, and uh, if in any way you need help, just let me know too, because I mean, it's really uh, for personal experience. Just I've had stuff happen to me, and I would like to actually people know my experiences as far as what to do, because uh, I've been through identity theft. Uh, my credit cards messed up because of that, you know, that I actually had to go to do bankruptcy because I didn't have no way to actually pay all this stuff that that people did to me, you know. Yeah. So I think what you're doing is positive and uh, I like I, 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 I like the incentive of it, you know. So, but yeah, but if you, if you need help, let me know. Thank you. Yeah, I think you're in a, I think what you're going through is actually what it is. I can relate and I'm sure a lot of students are in the same boat or, or getting there. So yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll definitely meet and, and get, um, get together or something. And I will follow up with you for sure about, about that. Yeah. Well, I hope you have a good weekend. Take care. Okay? Well, thank you.